Hey everybody. Now on to part two. So in the last video we looked at multi-group factor analysis assignment and kind of worked through that given our updates using the equal test in my package. What we're going to do now is do part two where we're going to look at running that multi-group analysis one more time but also do latent means. So um, kind of a combo of both things that are presented in that tutorial video. So I do assume that you've watched the video that covers this one that covers how to work one of these. You don't necessarily have to watch part one, but if you're wanting more examples, you can. In this particular one, we're going to look at the DAS, which is the Depression, Anxiety, and Stress Scale, which has these kind of uh, these items on it. And we want to see if that model is invariant for gender. So let's start there. First thing I want to do is import the data set. So let's read that in. I'm just going to look at what that looks like real quick. And this one's really great because the questions are actually in order, but we're still going to have to type them out with the numbers to create our model. We can tell that the gender variable does actually look like it's like been updated. So even though I have in here one equals female, two equals male, it appears the gender looks like it's probably okay. Great. I can also make sure there's not any missing data by if uh, use in a if any, so let's see. All right, no missing data to deal with. Great, this is our very quick data screening here. So the next thing we're gonna do is program an overall model. So let's see. Insert a new chunk here. Let's just do overall dot model. Oh, real quick. Let me clear out the last assignment just so it doesn't get confusing here. And what we want to do is call that model uh, or make the Levon syntax for this model. So let's do depression is approximated, so equals tilde. And I'm going to close my model too just to get answers here. The questions go Q3. I'm going to do some highlighting and then some quick uh, regular expression replacement here. So anxiety is, oops approximates these. Okay, this is not valid syntax, but watch me turn it into valid syntax. Great. All we're going to do is do this and replace that with like a Q. Let's see. No, I want to replace it with a plus Q. I think. So I've just now made it formatted correctly. Just need to add the cues here and here, right? So we're adding all these questions together to make our Levon syntax. So we've got a three factor model here. Oh, doesn't run the whole thing. <laughs> there we go. Um, I think if you sandwich the quotes, nope. I don't know why it doesn't run the whole thing. But. Okay. Next step is to run our overall dot fit. So we're going to run that as a CFA. We're going to do model equals overall dot model. And then the data is our master data set. And mean structure equals true. So don't forget, we have to include that the entire time so that this model matches the measurement and variance steps we'll take later. Okay, so that's the main key here for this first CFA. Uh, object, oh. I apparently did not run this chunk, or I cleared it out. One of the two. Let's try again. There we go. So we just want to take a quick glance at the summary. Make sure nothing weird's going on. No, uh, I should turn on R squareds, but no negative variances. Everything looks like it's doing pretty good. Um, and in general, with summary, I recommend these arguments. So standardized equals true. Fit dot measures equals true. So you can see the fit indices and R square equals true. And what that will do is show you the fit indices so you can make sure you're pulling the right ones. It'll show you the standardized, completely standardized solution. 
And I can tell my anxiety and uh, stress here are a little super correlated. Here under estimate, that's a covariance. So um, don't think this is a correlation. This would be a correlation. And these are really highly correlated. So I'll have to be careful here not to run into Haywood cases where these are too correlated. Um, it does include the intercepts, which is good because we turn those on for multi-group models. Variances appear to be positive. And no weird negative values in R squared either. So no Haywood cases yet. Keep an eye on that factor that's too high. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the multi-group steps and then we'll start to add them to the table. And I will 100% say that I'm not super used to this function yet, so I'm going to copy it, talk about what it does. So I can't type it from memory, for sure. All right, so we're going to use the equal test MI package to run all of the other models. So use eqmi.main. So we're putting in our overall model, data set, the name of the grouping variable here, which I think was gender. Let's scroll up and look. Yeah, gender. Well, I was typing. Okay. Mean structure equals true. Great. These are all the Levon arguments. The rest of this shows me the output for uh, means levels and covariance levels, um, multigroup constraints. We're going to focus on the measurement model itself. So we're going to do a slightly different amount of steps. So I'm just going to turn quiet equals true to not see all the output right now. I'm leaving off equivalence tests. Although you can see the first video, I talk about those a little bit, and then some of this other pro projection stuff we'll leave on that we might use later. So let's run this. It will give me a warning that I'm not actually using the um, RMC adjustment because I turned off equivalence testing, which is fine. And then we would want to find all the models we were looking for. Now in this first video, I talk about each um, model and where I can find them and which ones they are. I'm going to kind of skip that step to make this one more focused on latent means. So uh, essentially what I'm going to tell you is that you can find them. <laughs> it's up to you got to know where to look. So uh, the first video also talks about how I figured out which ones were which, but we would do multigroup.fit, dollar sign, conventional sim, dollar sign again, Levon output, dollar sign one more time, and here are all of the saved models that it, that, um, it ran. So for group one, uh, we'd have to figure out who this is. So I'm gonna run a summary real quick just to know which one's group one, which one's group two. It does not actually label them. So I'd have to look at the sample size. So I've got 246, so I'm scroll, scroll, scroll. Looks like that's female. So group one's female, that makes group two male, but just, to confirm, group two, 186, and that matches my table. Okay, whoa, actually, 165, sorry, that's degrees of freedom. I was like, hold on a second, <laughs> that does not match. So 165, okay. excellent. Then the other models that we're going to use, and you would want to run summaries, and on each of these models, I would recommend looking at them, making sure you don't have any Haywood cases, looking at the output, sort of proof of point that they are the model you expect them to be. But once we have group one and group two, then we wanted to look at configural invariance. So for that one, it's fit.combine groups. Okay. Then for the um, metric invariance, that one actually is called fit.metric. That's handy. For scalar invariance, This is the slowest part of all of this. It's called scalar invariance, great. And then the last one is, to me, the weird one. There's two ones that say residuals. And you wanna use strict dot residuals. That one is the one that controls for intercepts and loadings before adding the residuals. So just proof here. The metric invariance step, remember this is the step that you control the factor loadings. You constrain them to be equal across groups. 
If you look, you will now see that the factor loadings are have a label. When they have a label, that means they're being, well, it means they have a label, but for, you know, female here and male here, since they're the same label, they're being constrained to be the same estimate. So 0.8 and 0.8. So that's how I know that I've got the right models because metrics should be in uh, loadings and that's the only place it had labels. Scalar should be loadings and intercepts and it has both of those labels. And then strict should be loadings, intercepts, and residuals, which has, if you run that model, has all three. I'm gonna spend a lot of time looking at the models though, um, which you can do in the first, video, first uh, overview video or the last video we looked at them a little more. Let's just make this table. Okay. I'm gonna start by building a blank matrix and that just allows me to like add things in it. And I'm sure there's an easier, a better way to do this. So I'd love to hear about it. But I have built this um, table print matrix and this is where I'm just going to put in all of my numbers. So I've got a space for it here. Uh, and this is the way I actually do in my papers. <laughs> so when we build models, we kind of stick them in a table and print out the table. And for all groups, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this one to five, right? So it's gonna label this model female and I wanna fill in these numbers here. So chi-square degrees of freedom, rem C, S, R, M, R. Okay. So I'm gonna hit enter so you can see this a little better, but what we're gonna do is do fit measures okay, for our multigroup.fit. For group one, which is Female. Oh, this is all groups. Drats. Okay. For this one, we're going to do fit measures of uh, overall dot fit. Okay, nothing too crazy there. And I've got two parentheses here. I'm going to hit comma and I'm going to concatenate a group. So I want chi square, which is chi square degrees of freedom, R M S E A, S R M R, and C F I. And then I'm going to quick hit enter here just so that this displays a little bit better. And then here's row one. Let's look at row one now. So we've got a chi-square, degrees of freedom, BRIMC, SRMR, CFI. I could confirm that by looking at the summary of our overall fit. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> With fit measures turned on. Unexpected symbol. Oh, I put a dot. Drat. Come on. There we go. And in that summary output, we could just kind of confirm that I did this correctly. So the test statistic for the model is 547. That's chi square here. 186 degrees of freedom. Great rem C here, 0.069. So we're actually getting the entire number here. If I were to publish this, I would round all of those to three digits. Uh, but for right now, keeping the full number is actually pretty helpful. SRMR and then CFI. Okay, 0896. These last two are NA because they don't, they're not part of the model comparisons we're going to do for measurement and variance. Okay. Now let's fill in female, which we decided was group one. This is where it gets really long. So fit measures for multigroup.fit, conventional sim, Levon output, group one, okay. comma. I'm not gonna recreate anything here because you guys already suffered through my spelling. Let's do um, chi-square degrees of freedom, rem C, S, R, M, R, right? And then I, when I cut and paste it, I pasted too many closed parentheses. So this is the same fit measures that I've done here. I've just replaced it now with the big long name of that model. So let's look at females. Oh, I closed it. Okay. So do female model fit? Well, I expect there to be a little bit of a degradation in fit when we break this down into groups. Sometimes, sometimes the models get better, but in general, they tend to get a little worse. And our CFI is maybe not so great. Um, 
And then here, I, the the real hang up is the fact that these um, factors are so highly correlated, which is a question that um, a paper by um, Eugene Chin and I and some other people kind of talked about being an issue. So uh, that would be something to explore, but just for um, uh, demo purposes, we'll pretend like this is okay. <laughs> So I would really want to know why maybe the female group is, is low here. Uh, and then I'd also really want to control for the fact that uh, the model may not be great. But let's do, let's add men and see how they do. I'm going to cut and paste this, hopefully with good success here. And this is not group one anymore, it's group two. Let's see how guys are doing. About the same. So there's no big changes. It's not like either model blew up. And if I looked at the summary of these, I would know if they had Haywood cases. So the real key on this first step is just making sure that each group individually fits before we combine them together, because that can be a real indicator whether multi-group models are appropriate. So if one group's model will, will, will not converge or has a Haywood case, that's a good time to talk about these groups are pretty different. I don't generally have problems here. Let's stack them together now. This is our pancake model. We're gonna put both into the same, the models at the same time and see if when we just force them to have the same picture, which is pretty much what we do with separate groups, but now together in one model, if I have the same picture, do I see an invariant structure. Okay. At the moment is, I don't know, so let's try it. So this is called configural invariance. You'll see the degrees of freedom has doubled because we've taken the male model and the female model and stacked them together. This is what the pancakes thing is about, but basically we've put them on top of each other. And we see that the model is like pretty, um, you know, we'll argue over whether the CFI is any good, but you know, uh, it's pretty consistent. So I'm not seeing any huge changes. And then I would look at the summary to determine if the uh, model has any problems. If we want to add metric invariance, what I'm going to do is paste that same output. But now do fit.metric. Come on. Ah. Got excited with my tab metric. There we go. And we need two numbers out here. So um, metric invariance, what we want to do is we want to subtract the CFI from configural invariance from the CFI from metric invariance. So I am going to copy this and just tell it to give me the CFI minus I'm hit enter just because this gets very long, very fast. The um, metric one. So I actually should have copied this. Okay. So what we're doing is we're taking the configural invariance CFI minus the metric CFI. And we just want to make sure that's not over 0.1. And so that's one number and I need one more to make my table complete because it has to have seven different numbers. And at the moment, or seven, seven, eight different columns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is a question mark. So we don't know because we haven't looked at the numbers. Excuse me. All right, so let's look at row five here. See what happens. We can answer our question. Is it invariant? I'm going to scroll over and I'm just first going to quick make sure that I have math correctly. So we want this number minus this number. So we uh, sequentially subtract. Okay, point oh oh four. That would be invariant. So we can now change this to yes. Uh, well, the column says, are they different? So I would say it is invariant. Great, let's keep going. Let's do scalar invariance. Okay. And because you guys, really my spelling is so bad, we're just gonna cut and paste and edit. 
But here, be careful, because I have definitely cut and pasted and done the wrong model before. So the first one should be scalar invariant. So it's fit.scalar. The fit indices stay the same, but now I want to subtract metric invariance minus scalar invariance. So it's the same one as this current step. And here we don't know yet. So is this invariant? Yep. Okay, it's less than 0.001. But again, you can come up with your own rules here. There are some suggestions to use a more strict criteria than 0.01. So whatever rule you are using, you would look for that rule. Ooh, I hit the button that ran everything, I think. <laughs> okay. Don't print yet. Well, we're doing good so far. Let's try for strict invariance. So now I want to do fit dot strict dot residuals. We want to take the scalar invariance and subtract the residuals. And then just so I don't screw up my table, I'm going to say question mark because I don't know yet. And here, oh no, we failed. So this is not invariant. Now we have to explore how we might do partial invariance. All right, so we're gonna leave our table here, but we're gonna add some more stuff to it later. So for partial invariance, I probably need at least one more row. So I'm gonna add one more row, just rerun this whole box here, and that'll give me a blank row at the, Markdown always locks up here. It'll give me a blank row at the bottom to add my partial invariance. So it asked me, what pieces would I need to freely estimate to get to partial invariance? Well, I don't know, let's find out. So I'm gonna come back over here and copy this second one I did. And then talk about what all this does and edit it because it won't quite match what we need. But first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out the syntax for our specific step. Okay. So if you break down at the metric step, you want to do RS, or I'm sorry, <laughs> depression equals tilde um, question three. And then depression equals tilde question nine or whatever the questions are. So what I would have to do is tell it to run through all of the possible combinations for ah uh, for loadings here to estimate those if it was metric invariance. So you essentially do depression equals tilde three, five, ten, blah. Okay. If I'm interested in the scalar invariance, that's where it breaks down, I would then need to do intercepts. So I would do question three till day one, question three till day, question five till day one. So that's the Levon code for intercepts. For variances, it's uh, question name, tilde, tilde, question name. Okay, so we're gonna do question three, tilde, tilde, question three, question five, tilde, tilde, question five, etc. cetera. Okay, we're gonna do that for all of the questions. So, so this is why we're gonna run a loop um, so that we can do this more efficiently than cutting and pasting. Okay, so let me go back down to my code here. So under partial syntax here, I need to figure out where my column names are. So let me just look at the column names of our master data set here. It looks like it's one, two, three to the end. So three to 21, 22, 23. And then just in case, because sometimes I can't count, that looks like the numbers I'm interested in. So the paste function allows you to paste together things. So what this is gonna do, and I'll just show you, is paste together a vector of those residuals. So this is the residual for every item in a measured variable in our model. Great. Okay. I'm gonna create myself a place to store all my CFIs. 
So when I, oops, I have to actually run this. There we go. When I look at my CFI list, before I do anything to it, it's just counting up, but I know there's 21 items on the DAS, so I'm doing pretty good here. This is just a storage spot. So they're gonna be 21 numbers for me to fill in. And I'm gonna give those numbers names because that makes it easier to read the output once we've actually created those numbers. Next thing I'm gonna do is do a loop here. So I'm gonna loop over I, I is just counting. So I'm gonna do item one, then item two, then item three uh, of the partial syntax. So it's gonna do question three, question five, question 10, question 13. Let's think about our model here. So we're gonna do models, our overall model, data equals master, mean structure is true. Our group in this example is gender. <clears throat> We're working on the strict partial invariance. So I've got loadings, intercepts, and residuals because this is the strict step. So here I'm just matching. I'm doing residuals here. So residuals gotta be here. And then this one is left over from the previous example, but our partial, where we're letting each item be free. So remember this step is estimating what would happen if we didn't require all of them to be equal let's say all but this one. Okay, now all but that one. So this is one at a time with little light switches and you figure out which light is broken. Okay. Right, and that's gonna pull partial syntax dollar i, so that's gonna be number one, number two, number three, number four. Okay. Stick that into our list and we're just gonna keep a list of the CFI statistics. The great thing about that is now, then I can use it to figure out which one is the worst item. This is what the measurement invariance function in SimTools used to do. Give that a minute to run. There's 21 items, so that'll take a, just a few seconds. Perfect. Now I can look at each one of these individual CFIs and compare them, or I can do some subtraction. So I'm gonna turn off scientific notation, take my CFI list minus the CFI of the model you are trying to fix. So for us, that's multigroup.fit. And this is where we get into the strict residuals. So main key here on the subtraction is model you're trying to fix. Okay. So the CFIs of the fixed potentially models minus the CFI of the non-fixed models, give that to me in reverse order. And what this does is it tells me which ones I need to work with. Generally recommend doing these one at a time. Now these are pretty similar. So one problem comes in when the, the CFI is approximately the same amount of bad for each of them. Should you do both of them at once? Um, I don't have a good answer to this question. You could, you can justify this either way. I'm gonna do one at a time because I like to um, kind of create a minimal criteria for, for invariance. But I might be hard pressed to argue why I picked one over the other, except that mathematically this one is just a touch larger. All right, so I'm gonna now rerun. I'm gonna hit some buttons here, there we go. <laughs> go up here, I'm gonna rerun this model. Now in theory, we only want the last step, but by rerunning the entire model, if you watch the last video, what you'll see is that we had to do invariance twice. So it helped to have the entire model saved because then we could look at the steps after the step that broke. And what you wanna do is add right here, so we're gonna do group.partial not group.equal, even though I want it to be. Um, and we've only got one of them, so we're gonna do RS. I've already forgotten which one it was. Let's reprint this. Uh, not RS, that was the last example. So question 11, residuals, comma. Okay. So that group.partial function says everything but this one. Okay. Now that's not gonna affect any other step so even though we're adding this to that original estimation that's got group one, group two, combined groups, scalar, metric, it doesn't matter because for those models, this uh, residual is not constrained. So we will only add it in that step that it matters. 
other thing I'm going to do while it runs is come up here, copy the last line of my table, we're going to add row 8, and we're going to say strict invariance, it's actually partial strict invariance, focusing on question 11 here. I don't know what I just did, I think I hit command Q, whoops, so shift, there we go. Now, this is actually almost right. So I want to subtract the, uh, or I want to include my fit measures, great. And then I want to subtract the scalar model from my new strict residuals, which is actually uh, underscore two. So if I added this model and add in this uh, freedom <laughs> for question 11, um, does that bring me up to the previous model scalar? values. So does that bring me to a partially invariant model? Okay, so I want to take the original scalar minus my new updated model. Okay, so you don't want the same line you had before. So well, which is the same reason you need to edit this one. Okay, so if you have the exact same numbers, um, you've done one of these steps wrong. So you've either forgotten to add the partial line here, or you've forgotten to fix your um, table code. Problems with cutting and pasting, but you don't want to watch me type this whole thing. All right, so our numbers should get a little better in the CFI category, and they do. And then here, what I'm seeing is now it's less than 001. I'm sorry, 01. It's less than 01 by the skin of its teeth. And so I could stop here, or I could add that other one in and say, well, they're basically the same amount of bad, so I should probably include both. Both approaches acceptable. I would just suggest you pre-register what option you're going to take. Um, so I could change this and just say it's invariant because if invariate, oh, invariant, <laughs> that's spelled wrong every single time. You guys are letting me get away with this. Anyways, so um, uh, what I would do here, I'm going to stop, but I might consider including the other one. I'm mostly going to stop so that we can move on to latent means. All right. So what pieces would I freely estimate to get partial invariance? Minimally, this is question 11's residuals. Okay. Interpret my findings. What does this mean? To do that, what I'm going to do is run a summary of my final model, fit number two, and then the last model. And I'm going to figure out what's what's happening here. So this particular item is question 11, which is on the stress scale. So you'll see there's a blank here. So for females, the estimate for question 11 is 0.49. Yeah, I think females are first. Yep. Yeah. Let's scroll down, look at males. And then for males, it's 0.25. So for females, there is twice the amount of variance than for males. Okay. So for question 11, females have twice the variance than males. Okay. I, I know I have the scale saved. Let's see if I can find it real quick. So question 11 is I found myself getting agitated. Women ha are using twice the spread than men. Okay. And to really contextualize that, sometimes what I will look at, add this back, is the intercept. So the intercept for that question, okay, now for intercepts, it is much easier to look at the non-standardized solution because that's in the scale of the data. The intercept for that question, which runs from zero to three, is about two. So we're, we're talking um, that this is, um, this is a college student sample. This is kind of a, more towards the ceiling. Okay? It's a little, it leans a little bit more towards ceiling. Okay? And what's happening is women are using a half a point around that. Okay? This is variance. It's not, it's not standard deviation. So, you know, give or take, um, uh, are using you know, a range around that that is wider than men. So even though men and women have the same average score approximately, 
women are more likely to use more of the scale than men. And that applies to me that women's experiences for that question are just more variable than men. All right, now let's add those latent means. Uh, I talked about in the first video, there's several different ways to do this. Um, I think I personally kind of like the items version because it makes a little bit more sense to me. So I'm gonna copy this from my example before and we'll kind of work through it, how to do it. Okay. So we're gonna save our predicted scores. So let me use this code as a guide here. And that means what we're gonna estimate using laugh predict the from our last model fit underscore two. So we're gonna go through this whole shebang. <laughs> oh no, not that last one. Uh, fit dot strict residuals. So final model, and we're gonna estimate the observed variables. So what that does is create a list. Predicted scores, predicted scores, where'd it go? Okay. And it's a list of each group. So I've got the estimated <clears throat> observed variables for each group. And by that, I mean, let's look at it. Uh, oh, well, I meant to do view, but you can kind of see it over here. These are all of the items. So it keeps the column names. I don't know why it doesn't label the groups here. Um, and these are like the, you know, if I recreate this model, here are the estimated scores for those items. Uh, now I will convert that into a data frame. So I'm going to do call our bind is just going to stick those two bad boys together, but I really have to add, um, a gender column. I'm gonna call it gender just to match to our own data set and tell you how I figured out these numbers here. So what I did was create a table of gender and it told me there's 246 females. Okay, so I'm going to repeat female 246 times and then male 165 times. And what that does, when I look at predicted scores now, this is a data frame that has which gender they're in. Okay. So it's kind of taken those two, and it's not in the same order as the original data because your men and women may be mixed together, but it is now I can at least know it's which group it is. And then the rest of this I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna sum up their scores, but I can't actually, I can't use the sum function very well. So what I've gotta do is create a sum for each one. Let's do depression. Okay. To do that, I'm going to apply. I'm going to add up my depression scores. So I got to figure out what columns those are. Okay. And the depression ones are the first seven. So thank you, whoever put these in order, and it wasn't me. <laughs> so one through seven. And I could use the question number names as well. Uh, one for rows, sum those bad boys up. And I'm gonna do that same thing twice more. Anxiety is next. Okay. And now what, what do you put in this column number? You're putting um, here whatever the column numbers are that map onto your question. So if they're not in order, this may be like question one, question seven, question eight. So it uh, kind of depends on how you feel about subsetting here. You could uh, tell it to use the column names so you know which ones you're pulling, or you can tell it to use the column numbers. Okay. Add those up. Or if you're a tidyverse person, you could do this with um, mutate. I am not very good at tidyverse. I'm getting better, but you would mutate tell it to add all these columns up. Uh, stress. I just like apply. Once I finally figured it out, I remember when I first started R, apply was like magic. It's still partially magic. Great. And then to, pr to print these out, like the question asked, what are your late means? 
Okay, in standard deviations, I'm just going to use some T apply because I like T apply. Um, suppose you could do some summarize by group as well. Uh, whatever floats your boat. Uh, depression by group, right? So first one DV, second one IV, gender, yeah. Give me the mean. Okay, so here's my means for men and women. So women are a little lower on depression, which I actually find a little surprising. Um, here's our standard deviations. Oh, oof, sorry. <laughs> and then we do that same thing for anxiety. And then we do the same thing for stress. Women and men are equal. And then for stress, women are higher scores. Okay. Now that we have all these numbers, we could use a t-test to determine if they're significantly different and include Cohen's d. Well, what I am going to do is use the moat library. So a little self-promotion here. Because the moat library includes a function that will show you what t is. But to make this even more clear, now I wouldn't normally recommend cutting and pasting this like six times, but we're gonna do me, oh, sorry, SD depression equals, or I'm trying to be better at my equals. I am not an equals Nazi though. Uh, I think either way, whatever way you want, right? Good code is code that runs, does what you think it should do. Right. Uh, one more T apply for in. All right, so what I've done now is I have the T applies that give me the means, standard deviations, and in, and I will, oops, <laughs> sorry, this last function should be length. Try that again. I'll do just one of these um, so you can see what's happening. And then you would repeat the same thing for anxiety and stress. So it's be the same procedure, you just do it one more time. Okay. So here, the d.independent t function needs two means, two standard deviations, and two ends. So by saving them, I can now do mean underscore depression number one, mean underscore depression number two. I haven't run these, I don't think. Um, then two standard deviations, so it's SD number one, SD number two. This keeps you from typing the literal numbers. And then in depression one, and in depression two. And alpha, we're gonna go with 0.05. Okay, we could lower this if you wanted to control for all three tests. And that will print out everything you want to know. But if you go to the very bottom, you'll see this in kind of APA style format. So our D, our D between groups is what we would probably consider smallish, right? So if we use 0.2 as small and 0.5 as medium, this is mostly in the small range. And then it has a confidence interval that kind of covers small to medium. And our T test is significant. Okay. And um, also, do we have a very large sample size? So this would be maybe small but important differences. And we could do that three times, once for depression, once for anxiety, and once for stress. And then if you can't remember who has the higher mean, it does actually give you the means in the output too. So mean for M1. So female's mean is 9.78, and then the male's mean is 10.82. And it does allow me to make sure I've done this correctly because, I, like I said, I find this a little odd that the the male's mean is higher, but it is in this case. So to complete the assignment, I would do that twice more for anxiety and stress. And so this example has worked you through a multigroup analysis with partial invariance and then applying that to latent means. One quick note is that there is a function embedded. It doesn't map the assignment, but there is a function embedded in the equivalence testing where we could get d values at least 
and this is where I'm going to struggle to remember it. It's underscore two. This time, instead of convention sim, we're going to do projection results and get the projection. Okay, it is like crazy, crazy. Let's see if we can get just that one table. Latent test is the one we want. And so it does give you the latents in the same order. And I haven't quite figured out what these numbers represent. I assume this is their, their, if I looked up the citation for this, this is the way they're estimating the latent mean because these don't map onto the numbers that I would expect, right? So these are not the, the average scores for items, but it does give me a, a D value. You know, doesn't that D value doesn't completely match because this is a different type of test than calculating Cohen's D on the predicted scores. Um, but this is a way to tell a different way um, to do kind of a latent means test. You can also do a latent means step in multigroup analyses. Um, and I would say though the like idea of is if this important maps similarly. So what we would find if we did this was small but interesting, um, nothing and pretty much nothing. So the conclusion is the same, even if the numbers aren't quite the same. So that's another option that you could do to do some um, D values for latent mean differences. That's a kind of a different test. Um, so class assignment for multigroup analysis covering uh, invariant steps, partial invariants, and latent means.